Hello, my name is Ashley Palmer and I'm the Conservation Education Specialist at the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District. In this presentation, Introduction to Rain Barrels, we'll look at what rain barrels are, why they're important, and how to use them. By the end of this video, we hope that you will be a well-informed rain barrel advocate and that you'll be ready to build and install your own rain barrel with the Northern Virginia Rain Barrel Program. We're happy to provide you with this resource as part of the Northern Virginia Rain Barrel Program, a partnership between many government agencies, clean water advocates, and numerous individual volunteers that provides low-cost rain barrels to the residents of Fairfax County and its surrounding jurisdictions. To give you more context for the role that rain barrels play in environmental stewardship, we'll first look at what a watershed is and what we can see to indicate the difference between a healthy and impaired stream. We'll then discuss runoff and low impact development to gain greater understanding of the need for water conservation. Then we'll take a closer look at the benefits of rain barrels and their use. Overall, why should we consider implementing rain barrels on our properties? Rain barrels collect rainwater runoff from the roof and are connected to the downspout. Water collected in the rain barrel can be reused and contributes to sustainable living. Out of all of the sustainable practices available to homeowners to implement, rain barrels are some of the easiest to implement and are generally low cost. Implementing rain barrels on your property is part of a larger effort for each homeowner and property to make changes to mitigate excess stormwater and keep streams healthy. Before we take another look at rain barrels, we'll take a closer look at that big picture. A watershed is an area of land that drains to a stream, marsh, or other body of water. If you're in an area that receives precipitation, you're also in a watershed. Watersheds are bounded by areas of higher elevation, like hills or mountains. In the image here, you can see that all of the watershed is bounded by those taller peaks. If the largest body of water in a watershed, be it a river, a lake, or the ocean, receives water drained downhill from the rest of the watershed and anything that may have been carried by the water. Watersheds come in all shapes and sizes. You're often in more than one watershed at any given time. They stack in each other similar to nesting dolls. The smallest watershed could even be the ones surrounding a puddle in your yard. The smaller ones are trickier to track and even trickier to manage. In Fairfax County, there are considered to be 30 watersheds, each named after the stream or body of water that they drain into. You may know your local watershed just by knowing your closest major stream. At the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District's office in the Harity Building near the Government Center in Fairfax, we are in the headwaters, or beginning, of the Difficult Run watershed. The water in the Difficult Run drains to the Potomac River, as does every major stream in Fairfax County, so we're also in the Potomac River watershed. From there, the water drains to the Chesapeake Bay, and finally the Atlantic Ocean, making Fairfax County part of the Chesapeake Bay and Atlantic Ocean watersheds as well. You've probably heard of the Chesapeake Bay watershed before. It's the largest watershed on the East Coast and covers more than 64,000 square miles. It's made up of five major rivers, including the Potomac River, and covers land in New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and the entirety of Washington, D.C. With a watershed that is home to 15 million people and more than 3,600 species of plants and animals, protecting water quality in the Chesapeake Bay watershed is a vitally important group effort. What indicators do we know of good water quality? How can we tell if a stream is healthy? A healthy stream will have most, but perhaps not all, of these factors in common. Native vegetation and a vegetated stream bank with a tree canopy to cool the water indicate that the stream banks are stable. A stream with few indicators of erosion like this shows us that there is not much stormwater runoff near the stream, and what little runoff enters the stream is not enough to disturb the stream channel and shape. A healthy stream with clear water, abundant and diverse native flora and fauna, and a lack of obvious pollutants like trash or litter indicates that the water in this stream can support a healthy ecosystem. In contrast, impaired streams are often unable to support a surrounding healthy ecosystem. Eroding banks, undercut trees, a lack of bank vegetation, and silt covering the stream bottom are all signs of increased erosion. 
Too much water flowing too quickly through the stream during and immediately after rain events leads to channelization, where the banks of the stream are unable to hold the increased water flow. The stream channel grows in both width and depth, causing erosion and making the banks less stable. In cases of extreme erosion, like the photo on the left, banks can become increasingly unstable until trees fall. An impaired stream might have visibly polluted water with trash and debris, like the photo on the right. Polluted and impaired streams can't support much life. There are a lot of contributing factors that can add to a healthy stream becoming impaired, but the largest by far is urban development. Urban development is the development of land from its natural state to one that supports the residential expansion that creates cities. Urban development and the impact that it has on our local streams is directly correlated to an increase of impervious surfaces. Pervious surfaces are those where water can enter or permeate the surface and travel through the soil to reach the groundwater and travel to streams. Impervious surfaces block the natural flow of water, carrying it over surfaces rather than through them. In this diagram, you can see that the amount of runoff increases with the amount of impervious surfaces in an area. As runoff increases, more water enters nearby streams instead of infiltrating the soil and percolating through the soil naturally. This increased flow in streams is what leads to stream bank erosion. Runoff carrying pollutants and debris can also contribute to making a stream polluted or impaired. Conventional urban development can be seen throughout Fairfax County. When we look at stormwater management in particular, conventional development tries to give stormwater the opportunity to infiltrate into the soil through stormwater ponds seen in the photo on the left. Stormwater ponds often have compacted soils that do not allow for the same efficient infiltration as natural ground cover. Conventional parking lots that have the parking lot islands seen in the photo on the right. These parking lot islands serve to break up the impervious surfaces, but they are also often filled with mulch and compacted soil, which do not allow water to infiltrate effectively. Low impact development, in contrast to traditional urban development, seeks to minimize impervious cover and conserve natural ground cover. Low impact development tries to replicate pre-development runoff in volume, timing, and rate. By installing low impact development practices, we can prevent pollution on a large scale in parking lots, garages, and other public spaces. It also gives us the opportunity to install these practices on private property and allow each citizen the opportunity to help prevent pollution. The four practices shown here, green rooftops, downspout filtration, filtera boxes, and biofiltration, all use plants with strong root systems to increase infiltration and absorption of water. Porous pavers, like the low impact development practices seen on the last slide, use plants and pavers with holes in them to increase the infiltration of water. Planting trees and improving soil, while not exactly a development practice, can be used to treat areas of compacted soil that prevent water infiltration. Creating rain gardens like those in the bottom right photos provides better infiltration than traditional stormwater ponds because they are amended with treated soils that allow water to percolate down through the soil easier and more effectively. Rainwater storage, as with the cistern in the bottom left image, or the rain barrel in the upper right image, can hold some of the excess runoff from impervious surfaces to be used later in times of reduced rainfall. It spreads out the input of stormwater into the watershed over time instead of one large input during the rain event. This particular low impact development practice, rain barrels, is what we'll be focusing on today. This low impact development site for a single family home features many practices which help to reduce runoff and increase the infiltration of stormwater into the soil. Note the rain barrel at the corner of the house, which could be directed to drain into either of the rain gardens on the property, or the reclaimed water could be used by the homeowners. How much roof runoff can you capture in a rain barrel? In answering this, your mileage may vary. Rain barrels are available from a wide variety of sources and can come in many different shapes and sizes. Rain barrels made in the rain barrel workshops offered by the Northern Virginia Rain Barrel Partners are made from repurposed pickle barrels and fit approximately 55 gallons of water. 
Let's take a look at how much water can be produced during a rainstorm and how much can be conserved using our rain barrel. We can determine how many gallons of rainwater can come from a single rooftop using some basic math. Let's assume that we're looking at a single family home with a roof that is 40 feet long and 20 feet wide. Laid flat, the roof area would look a bit like this. Now let's look at an inch of rainfall. There are 12 inches in each foot, making one inch equivalent to 0.083 feet. Here we're calculating the volume of water that would run off the rooftop during a one inch rain event. The volume of the space is equal to the length multiplied by the width multiplied by the height. We'll add in our roof measurements and one inch of rainfall, which gives us 66.4 cubic feet. I find it's often difficult to imagine the size of a cubic foot, so let's transfer this value into gallons. Each cubic foot holds seven and a half gallons. In total, 498 gallons of water can be generated as runoff in a single one inch rainfall event from this single family home. With the 42 inches of rainfall that we normally see in our region, that same 40 foot by 20 foot roof can produce 20,916 gallons of runoff in a year. This incredible amount of water contributes to erosion and pollution in local streams. Although no rain barrel will ever be able to hold all of your roof runoff, every gallon of water conserved is impactful. You can increase your reclaimed water capacity by using a rainwater cistern or by using rain barrels in a series. As the first rain barrel connected to the downspout fills, it will pour over into the next. Rain barrels offer many benefits. Reclaimed rainwater can be used around the house, particularly for watering plants during dry spells. Rain barrels help us conserve water and reduce runoff. They can be conveniently placed on almost any downspout and can save you money. You can use the water collected in your rain barrels in a variety of ways. Most commonly, the water is used to water outdoor gardens and indoor plants. The rainwater should contain no salt or chemicals and will have a slightly acidic pH. If you want to water your plants while you're away from home, you can set up a soaker hose or drip irrigation hose extending from the spout of your rain barrel to your garden and the rain barrel will slowly empty water into the garden over time. You can use the reclaimed water for washing and cleaning almost anything outdoors, including pets, the car, the driveway, muddy shoes, and the house itself. You can also use rain barrel water in toilet tanks. Reclaimed rainwater can be used to fill bird baths and ornamental ponds. Remember that the water conserved in rain barrels has not been treated and should not be used for ponds with fish in them, as it may not have the correct pH and will likely have little to no dissolved oxygen and may carry some pollutants from the roof. Finally, we have a few more rain barrel tips for you. The same issues concerning the use of reclaimed rain barrel water in fish ponds apply to the use of rain barrel water for cooking or drinking. This is non-potable water and should not be ingested. You should not use a rain barrel and collect rainwater if you have a moss killer on your roof. This will be carried into the water runoff and can damage your plants and make the reclaimed water unsafe for use. Like with the rain barrel in the image to the left, make sure that you use a screen on top of your rain barrel to prevent mosquitoes from entering and breeding in your rain barrel. To overwinter the barrel, empty the barrel, disconnect it, and cover the top to ensure that no water will freeze in the barrel and cause it to crack. Use collected water within a week or two to prevent algae growth in the barrel, and be sure to empty the barrel before the next rain is expected so that you can conserve as much runoff from the next rainfall as possible. Thank you for joining us on a presentation on the introduction to rain barrels. We've looked at what rain barrels are, why they're important, and how to use them. I hope that you'll now be a well-informed rain barrel advocate and that you'll be ready to build and install your own rain barrel with the Northern Virginia Rain Barrel Program. I hope to see you at a rain barrel workshop soon.